Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here this morning for the first issue briefing of day three of the World Economic Forum annual meeting 2015. Welcome also to our audience watching us live on weforum.org. Um, quite an exciting and interesting issue briefing we've got here, not just in terms of cast, I'll get to my cast in a minute, but also in terms of, in terms of content and, and, and subject. The subject is infrastructure. It's one of 10 global challenges identified by the World Economic Forum in 2015, um, areas that you know, the, the forum as an institution will be, will be providing resources and energy towards addressing some of the gaps and uh, hopefully identifying solutions to, um, to help close the uh, crippling tr uh, $1 trillion a year gap in infrastructure funding that the world currently suffers. Now, in addition to taking questions on the, uh, the, the issue of infrastructure financing itself, I'm very um, glad to be able to say that my two columnists have just come from an infrastructure investors summit and actually have some um, update on the, on, on the uh, events that unfolded during that session. So I'm going to invite them to make a couple of uh, brief remarks on, uh, on the issue of investor infrastructure financing and also what has been achieved so far today and then we'll move into Q&A. Um, to my immediate right here, I'm very uh, honoured to be joined by Gordon Brown, who's the chair of the World Economic Forum Global Strategic Infrastructure Initiative. He's also a member of parliament and was prime minister in the United Kingdom from 2007 to 2010. And he uh, sits on the Global Agenda Council on Infrastructure. Next, we have Thomas Meyer, the managing director of for infrastructure at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London. And again, a member of our Global Agenda Council network on infrastructure. Gordon, perhaps you could start. I think infrastructure has moved right to the centre of the economic agenda, indeed the economic and social agenda of the world. First, because only with investment in infrastructure can we get people water, get people electricity, get people hospitals and schools, so it's a real moral endeavour. And secondly, because it is vital to the economic growth we want to see, and uh, in a decade when we're now talking about secular stagnation, the limits of quantitative easing, low interest rates which make possible greater investment of course because it's cheaper to do, then infrastructure is absolutely crucial uh, to the recovery of the world economy but also to the provision of services that will make industry grow better. And what we found this morning is that the public-private partnership, the partnership between uh, international agencies and governments, it was attended by, for example, President Zuma of South Africa, the head of the International Finance Corporation, and investors, and it was brought, uh, brought together at this, we had all the major investors in infrastructure. There's a general agreement that there are problems that have got to be solved. If they can be solved, we could bridge that uh, gap. And we had a number of positive uh, initiatives, one put forward by Thomas Meyer, who will explain it himself today, uh, but others put forward by people who've got a, a, an interest in seeing infrastructure investment expand. Uh, we need to do more about project preparation because it's a costly element where there are no returns and the public sector needs to play its part. There are probably 100 pro pro project preparation facilities around the world, but we need to make them work better and more effectively so we can get projects from the initial feasibility uh, to uh, the construction start. Uh, and we also need to provide in enhancement for credit uh, and facilities for credit uh, so that we can get these big projects underway. If you think of the trillion gap, it's a thousand projects roughly with costing a billion dollars. And if we can find the credit and the equity to finance these projects, uh, then we can uh, start working on them very quickly. So a new credit facility, a new credit enhancement uh, facility, lots of discussion about how people will take equity and in infrastructure in the future. Uh, and of course, the World Economic Forum playing its unique role as a stakeholder organization, not only bringing people together, but offering that a new knowledge hub set up by the Australians, uh, we will add from the World Economic Forum uh, an, an annual or regular report on benchmarking, which countries are doing well, which sectors are doing well, what the problems are, are there regulatory blockages, how they can be solved, and, and, and really we're adding to what is a, a bank of knowledge that can transform the prospects for building, not just in America and Europe, because there are huge infrastructure, for infrastructure needs there, but also in all of the emerging markets, including some of the poorest countries in the world who need infrastructure most. Gordon, thank you. Thomas, uh, and, and your, your role in the, in the summit and, and perhaps uh, also the, the role that the EBRD is playing in, in helping address this yawning gap. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, um, uh, actually, I wanted to touch upon project preparation a, a little bit because uh, Gordon is quite correct in saying that this is the key issue that we are facing at the moment because we have uh, a supply side issue in that there are too few investable infrastructure projects currently coming to the market. We want to change that and this is why over the last year in the context of the World Economic Forum and in the context of much stronger uh, MDB cooperation, we have been uh, working and uh, structuring uh, quite a number of project preparation uh, facilities, uh, both by uh, the World Bank under the GIF, but also uh, uh, the, the regional MDBs themselves. And the idea here is uh, to increase the supply of investable infrastructure mm -hmm. projects over the next uh, 12 to 24 months significantly uh, so that investors, banks, institutional investors uh, can come in. Um, the role of, uh, of the uh, uh, Agenda Council mm -hmm. for Infrastructure in, in this context is very important because we have all the MDBs in that council. Mm -hmm. But uh, importantly, we also have the public sector and uh, key private sector stakeholders. Thank you. Thomas, you mentioned there are too few investable infrastructure projects. Gordon, you mentioned there are, you know, the trillion dollars uh, gap that we, that we talk about probably consists of a thousand billion dollar projects. So there's a bit of a, there's a, there's a you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a big gap in the middle there. What's wrong? Why are these the projects which so you know, so badly need to be um, you know, taken forward? Why are they not getting taken forward? Um, why do we need more infrastructure? Uh, Gordon said quite rightly, we need this uh, for growth, jobs, diversification, global competitiveness. In this interconnected world, uh, industry needs infrastructure to uh, deliver goods, um, consumers and producers need to be connected. And uh, this is why it is so crucial to have uh, modern ports, container facilities, supply chains that, that work efficiently and effectively, and may I say energy efficiently. And um, uh, w w th there is a gap, uh, you know, but let, let us uh, uh, remain positive as well because we are talking about a gap, but we also need to talk about the fact that in many countries, in many emerging markets, this gap is, is starting to become, uh, to be closed. And there are many positive examples. And uh, the, 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 uh, the role, for example, the World Economic Forum can play here is to bring uh, those uh, countries together that have, where it has worked with those where we still face significant challenges. Now, the proposals that we discussed this morning were quite interesting insofar as currently you see a situation where um, those uh, emerging market infrastructure projects that, that are investable are usually funded by banks, but we have real difficulties bringing institutional investors into the game. And uh, the idea that we have developed in the context of the World Economic Forum and uh, amongst the MDBs is uh, to create a first loss vehicle uh, that would be funded uh, by uh, the regional MDBs and the World Bank, uh, which would then provide uh, a certain first loss cover that could be extended to institutional investors and would bring, probably would bring institutional investors into uh, emerging markets that are already investment grade rated, have a good regulatory framework, but where that where that uh, rating upgrade has n uh, is not yet uh, achievable without MDB support. We think that uh, with, a, with a, a vehicle of around about half a billion US dollars and additional uh, regional MDB support uh, for these projects, we could perhaps uh, uh, raise funding in the market uh, in, in the region of about three billion US dollars. Of course, all this is an initial idea. Uh, developed in the context of uh, the World Economic Forum, but we now have a blueprint, and I think we have um, uh, the, 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 the green light by the investor community to start working on this. I think the important thing that people uh, uh, look at and say, look, there's all this savings around the world, there is capital waiting to be encouraged to invest, and there is all these great needs around the world that are unmet. What can you do about it? And the key to this <coughs> is that we need bankable projects, we need investable projects, we need projects that are not so risky uh, and are not so uh, 
uh, difficult to get underway, uh, that don't have huge bureaucratic or regulatory delays, that they can actually uh, deliver for the people of the individual country which, which needs, whether it's the water or the power or the electricity or the roads or the, or the rail. And so what we need to do to make these projects investable, to make them attractive to the investors who, uh, who, who might to want to come into them, is see what we can do to deal with some of the risk. And, and Thomas uh, Meyer has put forward a very innovative uh, proposal that if the first risk on credit is, is taken by the, the multilateral and the, the, the regional uh, development uh, uh, banks in certain emerging markets, uh, then we can make the projects more attractive uh, to investors uh, for the future. And then today, Raj Shah, who's the head of USAID, also announced that he had come together with the banks in a number of different countries, and he was offering uh, uh, the potential for a credit facility of around $10 billion. Uh, so two big announcements today, but it just emphasizes that we've got to get the public and private sector working better together uh, so that we can meet this unmet need by using, if you like, the unused savings of the world. Mm -hmm. Indeed, you know, it sounds like the, on, the, on the supply side, the steps have been taken to free up that money to make it more attractive to different investment investor classes. Um, but Gordon, you also talked about project preparation. It sounds like on the demand side, the, the, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done in, in, in getting projects to the stage where they are, as you say, attractive and, and, See, and less most, risky. The, the most expensive cost that is an outlay before you've even got any return is the design and the preparation of, of, a, of a road construction uh, project or a, a railway uh, or a power station. And sometimes these project preparation costs are in the order of 10%, and uh, you're getting no return while you're putting out hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars, and in some cases uh, millions and tens of millions of, of dollars. And so we need to find a way where these projects are of public benefit uh, to defray the initial uh, cost and that is a, a public-private facility. Now, some people want the public sector to do it on, in its entirety, but that's not going to be possible given the, the, the scale of the projects that we're talking about. So we need to find a way of bringing the investors, the private investors, into the project preparation side as well. We think there are about 100 project preparation facilities now being created because mm. there is a momentum to do things. Some are very small. Uh, some need coordinated properly, and, and Thomas and the European Regional Development Bank and all the regional development banks who have their own project preparation facilities now, they're taking steps to bring these together so that we can actually maximize the benefit uh, we can get from public sector and private sector investment. So vital to the ability to do a project, not the uh, most lucrative for, for an investor because there's no returns yet, but without that, you cannot have the project at all. Correct. If, if I may add, um, it's, it's very important that we see project preparation not only in the context of preparing the individual project. What we need to do as MDBs and as other stakeholders is, um, in, uh, is to increase the institutional capacity in emerging markets to do more projects in a standardized, investable way. And this is why um, our initiative certainly will not only focus on preparing physically individual projects uh, to, to a bankable level, but to have policy dialogue fix certain legal and regulatory issues and also um, uh, facilitate capacity building. And we have seen this already in some uh, emerging markets that this capacity uh, is being built up. And when it is being built up, the pipeline of projects dramatically increases. An example is uh, Turkey, uh, where, where we now have a, a very credible uh, pipeline of projects to be delivered mm -hmm. based on, a, on an already uh, interesting portfolio of PPP projects that uh, benefit from a predictable and stable uh, uh, legal and regulatory uh, environment. And, and that touches upon the uh, <coughs> comment you made earlier, I believe, Thomas, uh, the, from the, the summit you had, mm -hmm. you just come from, um, some best practices are start to, starting to emerge. You know, you're seeing parts of the emerging world um, where they successfully, the gap is being closed. Can you share some best practices um, on, on, on how we can see, how we can take forward, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the better preparation um, in different countries? Uh, yes, uh, you know, um, one of the very um, successful players in the world market in, in terms of institutional finance for infrastructure is, of course, Canada. Uh, Canada can show us um, how it, it could work elsewhere 
if the government and the private sector and local governments take take the right steps forward. And um, uh, about a year ago, we organized a, a, um, an, a seminar in London where we brought the Canadian pension funds, governments, and players together with the Turkish government and, and um, uh, uh, construction companies and, and players. And uh, uh, as a concrete result of that, of that event, for example, uh, the first international and domestic bond issuance uh, for infrastructure projects have happened. Mercy in Port uh, was a very attractive, a, a very interesting case where a joint venture between the Singaporean PSA and, and the local sponsor attracted institutional investor money from Asia and from, from the US uh, for, for modernization of a port. And last year we started to actually attract uh, domestic Lira uh, bond funding for quite a number of, of uh, infrastructure players in Turkey. So um, uh, what I like to say here is that we have examples of, of successful uh, uh, mature markets, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, the UK, um, uh, where the, the knowledge and the standards that have been applied there can be can be replicated elsewhere. And the fascinating thing is this is now a global market. I mean, uh, you know, <coughs> 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, these were domestic mm. issues. Most governments had to deal with, uh, with domestic finance, domestic um, players who were investors. And now people see this as, as, as a global uh, issue. You have mm. global investors, you have global infrastructure uh, initiatives, you have uh, obviously a glo global interest in projects in the emerging, emerging markets in particular. India, a huge amount of infrastructure investment um, ne needed. For example, they need to build a 1,000 universities they're committed to in the next uh, few years. Um, Africa, of course, big projects like Inga, the hydroelectricity project that could power 40% of Africa, but also roads, uh, a new interest in railways there, there as well. Latin America, a country that is uh, expanding, of course, uh, and big uh, infrastructure projects, road, rail, power. Uh, around the world, the desire to get more energy efficient um, uh, power stations and therefore uh, renewable uh, energy as, as a source of, of, of new investment. So there is a huge uh, global interest and where you have an expert in one continent, their expertise can be applied to every continent. I'm going to turn to a, a question which we received over social media now. Um, and unsurprisingly, being, bearing in mind this is an economic forum and economics has been uh, yep. you know, the heart of the news agenda this week with... Uh, the, the news from Europe and also, the, you know, the, the Chinese premier uh, talking earlier on this week, which is, you know, what, to what extent is the, is the economic climate going to affect the appetite and the ability to fund infrastructure projects? I'm thinking the, the, the end of the commodity super cycle. Is that going to uh, dampen appetite for building um, infrastructure in emerging markets such as Africa? Europe, growth is anemic. Is it going to, you know, it, are, are government balance sheets going to continue to pose a problem even though the private sector uh, is prepared to pay, play a part in funding the similar projects? Um, <clears throat> we live in a very uncertain world, and, and clearly there are significant challenges uh, ahead everywhere. Um, I would say, though, that um, uh, in the infrastructure space, we have such a backlog of uh, investments that, that are required um, that many of these investments will make sense in any economic climate. I, I give you an example. In, in many uh, ports in Eastern Europe, uh, the level of modernization is not yet sufficient to allow full containerization. Uh, so, so these investments will happen because there, there is an intrinsic uh, return on investment and they, they benefit um, an economy whether it's growing fast or not so fast. Um, uh, I would also uh, say that um, uh, uh, infrastructure the infrastructure space is a is a space which has much longer um, timelines, uh, and many of these projects um, uh, will take a, a few years uh, to be built, and um, and and so there there is a an underlying supply of projects uh, if they are investable that that will be done. Um, I would also like to say that there are some positive examples uh, that uh, that are currently uh, seen very clearly. For example, the Indonesian government has taken um, uh, the, the oil price decline over the last few months as an opportunity to cut uh, subsidies from the public budgets uh, 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 to energy users. 
uh, and is now redirecting those funds uh, to health, education, mm -hmm. and in uh, construction of infrastructure. So I think there are not only threats uh, that are coming from, from the current uh, end of a cycle, but also opportunities. Well, at its most basic, of course, as Thomas has hinted, I mean, low interest rates are an opportunity. Uh, if you can build infrastructure in a more cost-effective way using a long period of low interest rates, then uh, this is probably uh, the best time to invest uh, in, in infrastructure. And, and when we look at the theories about what's been going wrong with the world economy, like uh, secular stagnation, the idea that um, we can't reach full employment uh, mm. other than through credit booms, uh, then one of the solutions to this problem uh, is actually uh, investment mm -hmm. in infrastructure. And Larry Summers, who formulated the theory of secular stagnation for this era at least, He's argued that the, the infrastructure is a necessary element of securing long-term sustainable growth because it doesn't only employ people and get the economy uh, moving faster forward. Of course, it, it is also investment that is beneficial to future productivity that can be gained as a result of making the right and, um, and, and cost-effective investments in the future. So I, I would say mm -hmm. that uh, there is an issue about public debt, obviously, and therefore uh, the public sector is not in a position to invest in, in, in the way that it did in the past, uh, but that makes sense of private-public cooperation, uh, cooperation because the savings are at a very high level. There's a mm. glut of savings around the world. If we can have investable projects, bankable projects, um, sustainable projects that deal with the mitigation of risk, then savings that are available can be unlocked. So there's no shortage of capital. There's low interest rates. Uh, there is a, a desire to solve the growth uh, problem uh, by investment through infrastructure, and that uh, makes it all the more important that we have the good projects coming forward as quickly as possible. Gentlemen, you've both, you've both come from a what well, sounds like a successful meeting here this morning. How are you going to take that meeting forward and the, the results and, 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 and achieve further outcomes in 2015? What are your priorities? Well, the World Economic Forum has been given a mandate this morning by uh, people who were there from the pol political leaders to the business uh, leaders and the international institutional uh, leaders to take this forward. Practical proposals, action-oriented, not a talking shop, uh, to come forward with uh, more highly developed proposals over the next few months, to test them out uh, with, uh, with people in, in, in the different communities over the next few months. There will be a major uh, get-together at the uh, World Bank and IMF meetings in April. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the EBRD, and Thomas is probably too modest to say it himself, have convened a, a public-private uh, partnership mm -hmm. conference in, 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 I think it's June. June yeah. mm -hmm. We've got the World Economic Forum meeting in Africa in June, and that will uh, have a huge um, uh, uh, sort of uh, part of its agenda looking at the infrastructure issues in Africa from the Inga project for hydroelectricity to, to roads and to, to railways and to other power uh, forms of power station. And then we are mandated to come back next year uh, with more specific proposals. Uh, and, and really it's the interaction between the public sector internationally and at a national level and the private investor community, but also the construction, the engineering, the, the development uh, community, so to speak, the developer community, uh, it's this interaction that's bringing the best results. So I see um, the next few years has been a, a huge progress in bringing the public and private sector together, big increase in infrastructure investment if we can use this period of low interest rates to build upon. And the World Economic Forum as a partnership body with its stakeholders right at the center of this. And it's also going to be important in dealing with poverty around the, around the world because uh, the provision of water, electricity, the provision of hospitals and, and, and schools, uh, the provision, obviously, of um, roads and, and railways allowing people to travel, uh, these are essential elements in, in mitigating and reducing poverty in the poorest countries of the world. Thank you very much. A fascinating discussion. I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for taking time out of your busy schedules. I'd like to thank you, uh, our audience for joining us here today and our audience also watching this online. This issue briefing is now closed. I look forward to welcoming you back later on today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.